All right, everybody, how's it going? We've gotten a lot of requests in the uh, past after some of these episodes we've done about talking about everything that goes into making a rifle scope. And so we kind of figured who better to bring on to talk about that than Sam Hamilton. Now, Sam's last name might sound familiar after hearing a couple of episodes that we've had here with international man of mystery, Dave Hamilton, which is no coincidence. They're brothers. They're actually twin brothers, which by default, I'm just going to get it out there now. I tried to hide it on the last time with Dave. That means Sam is also my brother. Uh, But the funny thing is, so Dave plays a big role in our product development department now, which produces products that you ultimately end up seeing every day, you know, potentially out on social media or using on your own rifle, on your own hunts, etc. But it's his history that's the mystery. Right. His history is the mystery. Now, in this case with Sam, it's the other way around. Because what Sam does here, we can't tell you. Correct. I'm, I'm sorry to say. But uh, unfortunately, both of them are quite mysterious and uh, pretty much equally stealthy. So, uh, Sam, anyway, I guess, uh, I don't know, I hopefully didn't take too much away from your intro, but uh, for the listeners out there, I want to get a little bit better idea of who you are, sort of what you do, and then uh, yeah, any fun facts or anything like that. Yeah, so um, I actually... I actually can talk a little bit about what I do. Oh, cool! Um, so, so <laughs> oh, I. Oh, this is gonna be a better podcast than I thought. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then I have to kill everybody after oh, that. So oh, okay, all right. <laughs> but no. Um, so I I do lead an engineering group, but my engineering group's a little bit different than David's engineering group. So, uh, my engineering group really is focused more on uh, military stuff. So, um, we we're working on some some different um, cool military application type uh, things. So our group is separate from David's group and we focus on that. But the cool thing actually is that my group is, most of the guys who are in my engineering group are the guys who actually developed the AMG, mm-hmm. which, which is what we're going to talk about. And, uh, and so they kind of started out with the AMG and then we, we morphed into the group that we're in now. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I think... The AMG rifle scope is a sweet project to talk about when it goes into kind of making making a rifle scope, really. Um, you know, because when we when we talk about kind of the the product development that happens with Dave's group, for example, you know, I I think we don't hide it. I don't think it'll be any surprise to some people, in many people out there, that you know a lot of the development, the research, the testing, the engineering, things like that happen here. But for most of our products, the actual people we partner with to physically manufacture it, it might happen outside of this facility. But with the AMG, you not only had that very, very essential part of the development, but you actually also had a lot of the machining and you have the final assembly and uh, just a ton going on here behind the scenes for the manufacturing side of it. So we can kind of get that really unique angle from pretty much inception all the way to completion and what's ultimately on your rifle. Actually, in fact, right now, Mark brought out his... uh, his Weatherby right in front of us with an AMG on it just to uh, as a visual aid. So, um, you know, ultimately, we have the AMG 624. Now, um, there's I'm, a ton I'm of... I'm better with pictures, so... With pictures. It helps me to have it physically oh, right yeah. here. Well, I asked Sam to dr- bring out some crayon drawings, too, <laughs> to talk about. Um, but anyway, so, so Sam, maybe you can tell us and the listeners a little bit about what... What kind of, what, how did the AMG thing start? So the AMG, we're talking about the 624. There is the AMG UH1. We've actually talked about that one a little bit in the past with Dave uh, on the podcast here too. But maybe what was, what was the idea behind the, the AMG 624 rifle scope? And how did that whole ball get rolling? And it might be interesting too for people to know how long ago that, that ball got rolling. And even, even the why to do any rifle scope. Yeah. 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 Well, I think for me, um, it was, I mean, I like making things. Um, I like getting my hands dirty, machining, doing stuff like that. Um, that's a lot of fun to me. So uh, I've always had this dream of, of um, actually making our own product in-house and um, in a rifle scope in particular. So, um, you know, really uh, the AMG kind of came about because of that. So, you know, as, as the company grew and everything like that, we just... 
um, said, uh, we got, we got to this point finally where we were like, Hey, I think we can start, you know, maybe investing in, in some equipment and, and we can make a rifle scope. And, um, I think, you know, in retrospect, if I knew back then what I knew now, it probably would have been way more intimidating actually doing it because we just <laughs> sort of went, we just sort of started and, and it blissfully and, unaware. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, uh, and so, um, you know, actually, the the manufacturing process was probably way more difficult as diff than than designing the scope itself, which was difficult in and of itself. But anyway, so we we just wanted to we needed to get started somewhere, and so um, it was about 2011 um, when we actually first bought some CNC equipment and we got some space to to put it in and started forming our engineering group around that and um you know the first thing we just we we said well we got to develop a scope and so um the the configuration that we we ended up with was a 624 by 50 and we didn't want to tackle something that was um you know really crazy like a huge zoom range right off the bat um we wanted a configuration that we felt like was fairly popular could bridge tactical and hunting to maybe appeal to more people. So that's kind of how we came up with that design. Yeah. That so now one of the really interesting things I think that, that happens that, and we'll get into a lot of things that I think a lot of people don't quite even realize happens behind the development of a rifle scope. Um, I've, I've kind of kitted around and, and it's not, it's not to poke fun at anybody. It's really just, it's understandable. If it's not your day job, why, why should you try and understand every intricacy of a rifle scope unless it's, you know, your, your main hobby or something like that. But to a lot of folks, they come up and they see a, a tube. They generally kind of look the same. A lot of them with a, with the, you know, a few external features being different, but other than that, it's a tube with a big bell on the end and then an eyepiece on the other end that you look through. And there's, I mean, the only lenses that you really look at are like two. I mean, there's the eyepiece and the objective bell. But one of the really big parts that goes into beginning to make an optic like this is developing an optical system. Would you say, Sam, what, what happens first? Do you develop an optical system first or do you develop like a body of the scope first? Or or do you, how do you kind of figure that out? Where to start? Uh, you have to, des you definitely have to develop the optics first. And, and you you have to have an idea of um, sort of an idea of, of the configuration that that you're you're going to develop as well when you develop the optics because just you know physical size limitations weight limitations are going to dictate um, the optical design but yeah absolutely you, you got to develop the optics first and then you wrap the mechanics around that okay Gotcha. So, like, at, just at completely out of curiosity, like the shape and size of rifle scopes that we see today, were size and weight not an issue? And maybe, maybe I don't know if this is an obvious question or whatever. Would they still look the same? Would people basically make them? I mean, if you could have them be any shape or size, or if you know the gun didn't have to be there, if you, I mean, are they the ideal shape and size? Or maybe that's a weird question. That might be dumb. But um, <laughs> yeah. it's actually, I'd never thought about that before, but. I mean, you you could change some things, like making the tube a lot bigger um, would maybe give gain you some uh, definitely some latitude for design, um, you know. Uh, but then obviously you're getting a lot bigger and a lot heavier, and the scope maybe gets further away from the barrel and stuff like that. So, you know, you look at like a camera lens, and a camera lens is like big and bulky the whole way through, right, like, right. you know, especially a telephoto lens where you know rifle scope like slims down for where the rings attach to it and everything like that. So that adds some limitation in the optical design and you got to work around that. So, all right. Well, here's my random question for the day, but so let's say, okay, so you get into making an optical design. What is, and, and the optical design has always been what's baffled me, especially because one day I remember walking over there and, and our optical engineer was hard at work, um, essentially bending light around what what is the optical system in a rifle scope? Any rifle scope, doing, and how how does one go about developing it? Like how do you develop it to make it it really good? Um, I mean, you, you're playing around with light, right? And you can change coatings, you can change curvatures, you can change spacing, alignment, orientation. 
What's that like? So I've heard it said, and I, I believe this is really true, that optical design is much of an art as it is a science. And I think that's really true because there's so many variables and there's so many ways to get to the same um, end point. And so um, really what it comes down to is you're trying to manipulate, in a, in a rifle scope anyways, you're trying to manipulate the light in a way that gives you a magnified image and you want that image to be recreated um, in a magnified way that is close to being um, the way that your naked eye sees it, but just bigger. Okay. But every time, you you know, when that light gets bent through all these different surfaces, so in, in the AMG we actually have 17 um, glass elements in that oh, in the wow. scope. So there's a is lot. Is the reticle of them. included in that? That includes the reticle. Okay. Um, which has a cover plate on it. So there's those are two elements. But there's so there's 15 other lens elements that have curvatures and thicknesses, and each lens element is a different um, chemical formula. So it's a different lens type, and everything like that. So there's a huge amount of factors when you start adding all those up that affect it. And um, so you never truly. Um, you, you, you never truly perfectly recreate the image. There's always a, a trade-off, you know, you're trading different things off. So you're just trying to get as close to that as possible um, once you get through the whole system. And so you're definitely going to be making some trade-offs no matter what you do. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but, but you want to um, get as close to the ideal as possible. So like when an optical engineer like Will, who we have here, goes to school, for example, are they learning like the different chemical makeups of different types of glass and different coatings and things? Is that kind of what they're playing around with? Like when he's on the computer there and he's got, I, you know, I wish we could show it. It's probably all proprietary or something, but it's like, I remember it was like a black screen. He had these lenses and, and there's different color spectrums or wavelength spectrums or something like <laughs> that, that he's, and he's changing things with the lenses. Is, is that kind of, you know, in curvatures, is that what they primarily learn and, and develop into this art? You kind of yeah, I would say no. Like the art part of it more comes from the specifics that are involved with rifle scopes. Um, probably what what they're learning more in school is is uh, more um, that's more hard science, and so they're learning. Uh, you know, they, they're learning about the different wavelengths of light. They're you know they're learning about um, you know what happens when you have a lens with a certain curvature and a certain um, physical characteristics. So, you know, one of the things that determines how a lens bends light is called the index of refraction. And so they'll be learning about stuff like that. And um, usually the examples that you're using in school are a lot simpler. And mm -hmm. um, um, and they're, they're more, um, you know, they're not uh, examples that are specific to rifle scopes. And rifle scopes are really unique in the fact that I would say the vast majority of optics that are used in the world, um, whether it be sensors for like in your vehicle or camera lenses or whatever, are what we call focal optics. So they're, they're a lens that's focusing an image onto a plane or a sensor or something like that. But rifle scopes are unique in that they're, they're called afocal. And hmm. so what that means is that they're not actually focusing the light down to um, a focus point. When the light exits the scope, it's actually what's called collimated, and so um, it's uh, it's like a, I'm trying to think of an easy way to explain that, but <laughs> but at collimated light, it means that all the rays are parallel coming out, and um, and okay. because what's happening is is your your eye is doing the final focusing onto your retina. Oh yeah, so it's that's... preparing the light to be focused by your eye. Huh. Whereas like a camera lens, obviously your, your eye... You're focusing it onto a sensor. Yeah, you're focusing it onto a sensor. And you can manufacture a bazillion sensors that are all exactly the same. Right. They're but always, you know, they're, they're almost always going to be flat. Yeah. So, so it's known. Whereas, you know, your eye, your retina is like that sensor. And so oh. it's, it's sort of like you could think of it as like if you already had a little camera lens and you were, in, and you were designing another lens in front of that camera lens. So you'd have to design the light to exit that camera lens in a way that it goes through the little camera lens so that it focuses on the sensor. Very, very interesting. That makes sense. So your eye ends up being part of the optical system. 
your yeah, actual, absolutely. Your actual it's, eye. It's like the final step in the process. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now, is that something... Wild. So that must be something that an optical engineer has to consider, obviously, then. Yep. Is that... Is there like is there like a standard eye that they like <laughs> that they try and standardize everything to, or since everybody's eye is different, is that always kind of the the tough part of this? You you standardize it um, usually towards, and that's what I said the the light being collimated, which would be essentially what an eye in its relaxed state would be looking at. So. Mm. Um, you're, so that's the thing about your eyes. It's really amazing. Um, you, you have a, a lens in your eye, and it's actually um, flexible. So you have this muscle that actually um, stretches it and compresses it. So the lens actually gets more curvature or less curvature in your in your eye. And so if you're focusing on something that's close in front of you, it it's compressing that lens and it's giving it more curvature. And if, then if you look far away, that muscle's stretching it and it's flattening the lens in your eye. Oh. And, uh, and so it's changing the, the focus um, point. Uh, what's really what it's doing is it's changing um, the image to keep it focused on your retina as the object you're looking at changes um, distance from you. And, and your eye can really account for a lot. We've, we've talked about this before too. Like, for example, if you've got, what am I trying to say? Like a set of binoculars that are maybe slightly, uh, out of focus, like you, you've twisted the diopter incorrectly or something like that. And the right eye is a little different than the left eye or, mm. Oh, what's the, uh, what's the other thing I think we've seen a lot when the reticle isn't perfectly in I focus, say the reticle focus and your yeah. eye can do a lot to, is it, to yeah. fix things. Yeah, we call it uh, adaptive. So your uh, the human eye is really adaptive, and so that's kind of what I was getting at with that muscle. Like it's it, and it happens so fast that um, that a lot of times, if some unless something's way out of focus, you won't notice that yeah. necessarily. Um, and uh, and and then over time, you'll get eye strain because you know it's it's something slightly out of focus, and you don't realize it consciously. And so your but your eye is compensating for that, it's well, flexing then, a yeah. muscle essentially. Yeah. And when you say when you're talking about that happening really fast, I think that's why we recommend if you are, you know, focusing your reticle or using your reticle focus to make those adjustments fairly quickly. Exactly. And, and, and glance and, down and, and trust your eye when it kind of first becomes like yep that's it and not really fiddle with it or you know look behind it because otherwise your eye is going to start doing that compensating and you're going to get essentially a incorrect yeah reading yep that's exactly i don't mean to get all philosophical and weird but isn't it crazy how many things our bodies do without us noticing no seriously or just like like i've been breathing this whole time right yeah but i used (laughs) to think too like when i would when i was in sports and you'd get an injury and you you'd get injured and you'd be like, I I honestly have no idea what's wrong with my leg right now, but your body is immediately rushing to fix that. Mm-hmm. You have to go to a trainer; they have to check things out. They got to tell you, oh, I think you might have torn this, or you might have strained that. But it's like your body knows what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't it ever tell your brain? Anyway, um, okay. So we talked about the optical system a little bit here, and I, the, the optical system is just something that's always so. I feel like you could just dive in deeper and deeper and deeper on it. And so, essentially, once you've developed this, though, you kind of got the general shape and the outline. Did you know prior to developing that optical system, for example, one of the interesting things about the AMG here, 624, is that it's a, it's a long-range optic, but it's got a 30-millimeter tube. Did you know off the bat that you want to have a 30-millimeter tube rather than a 34? Or, you know... Um, did you know some of these feature sets or did you really, was the focus mostly on the optical system and then the rest was going to get built around it? Yeah, we, we knew we wanted a 30 millimeter tube. So that's something that we had to know ahead of time because we had to know what diameter lenses we could put in the erector system and what we could get away with. And, um, and so like actually like one of the really common misconceptions out there that I've heard is people say, oh, the larger your tube diameter, the more light that gets through. And that's right. totally false. It's not true at all. Um, really the only meaningful thing that tube diameter gives you is, is either a larger field of view or more windage and elevation travel or a combination. So the larger your tube, the more 
either the more travel you can give in windage and elevation or the larger the field of view you can you can get out of it because you can make those lenses lenses bigger but they do not make the image brighter or let more light through or anything like that so when you were looking at that 30 mil tube for example now the trend these days is like kind of towards that 34 mil tube but you guys mm -hmm. wanted to go with the 30 mil but the unique thing is now, the Razor Gen 2 is probably arguably the most comparable scope to this. Mm -hmm. It weighs 20 ounces more than this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably part of it. You know, you look at just more mm -hmm. tube there. It's got a 34 mil tube. The interesting thing is this is very close to the amount of travel and field of view as the Gen 2 Razor. So yeah. now does that start getting into some of the engineering that goes into the mechanical design of it? Some of that, and, and some of it's also the optical design too, though. Mm. Um, so it, with, with optics, it's I mean, there's countless factors that play into things so you know what what determines the the final field of view and when when and elevation travel isn't solely defined by tube diameter but that's a big factor okay so there's other things that we can manipulate to do that too um you know such as objective focal length and stuff like that but like everything in optics everything has a trade-off and uh so um yeah we were able to um we were able to do some engineering in our system to try and, and get um, maximize the, the field of view and windage and elevation travel in a 30 millimeter tube to kind of achieve our goal of getting this lighter weight, more compact scope, but that could still do long range duty. Awesome. Awesome. So at that point, so you kind of have an optical design. I feel like I've, I've reached this point and I keep asking a, a rabbit trail question. You've kind of you've got your optical design, or at least generally speaking, when you get into now developing the mechanics of this scope that's going to basically wrap around that optical system. I mean, I can only imagine that involves a lot of mechanical engineering, things like that. I'd be curious to know some of the some of the thoughts behind, like let's say for example, this was the first scope we did a locking diopter on, so it's not like a fast focus eyepiece. Um, so. Uh, essentially the whole eyepiece itself actually will rotate in or out, and you can kind of lock that in place. Making the LTEC zero-stop system and these locking turrets from the Gen 2 Razor significantly smaller and more lightweight, uh, some of the materials choices, that stuff, I'd be curious to know how that sort of went um, before we dive into some of the machining and all that, that whole another ball of wax. But what kind of yeah. happened there? How do, you, how do you really get into all that? Yeah, I mean, it was a challenge because we wanted to make everything smaller and lighter. And uh, so there's just, um, you know, the things we had to weigh were manufacturing methods. Like, uh, you know, that that's one of the funny things that, that engineers a lot of times will joke about the guys who have experience versus maybe guys who are fresh out of school or something is, you know, just because you can design it in SolidWorks. I mean, you can design anything in SolidWorks. <laughs> it's on a computer. But, but can you actually make that? They're two totally different things. So... You know, that was the challenge is um, saying, how can we design this mechanically so that it's manufacturable, it can be assembled relatively um, painlessly, um, but still achieve those goals. And so, we, you know, that took a lot of, of thought and engineering in order to make that happen, make the, the components still be durable and rugged in the places they needed to be. But then we could, you know, cut weight in other areas, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, for example, in the Gen 2, we had some components in the turrets that were the entire component was steel, but but we looked at it and we were like, okay, well, really only s these certain parts need to be steel, and these other parts are, aren't doing anything but structural, you know, so those can be aluminum. And so how can, you know, maybe we can make this one piece two separate pieces and only make it steel where it needs to be so we can cut a, a lot of weight. So those are some of the things that went into the design and, and that, that took a lot of thought and engineering. Yeah, yeah. Can you speak to, we were talking about the tube diameter a little bit and the travel. Can you speak to how we got so much darn travel in this 30 millimeter tube? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of it was the mechanical design. So a lot of scopes end up being really bulky um, where the reticle is located. Um, where is the reticle located again? It's in the first focal plane in the scope. So um, generally speaking, uh, a reticle in a first focal plane scope is going to be um, right about where the turrets are. And in a second focal plane, it'll be where the magnification ring is. Okay. And so usually a scope that's got a first focal plane reticle in it 
um, there ends up being a lot of bulk around the reticle because the reticle has to be focused properly and everything like that. So there has to be a lot of these mechanical um, components there in order to make the make the thing easy to assemble and for everything to be aligned and focused properly. And so we, we put a lot of thought. We actually even um, were, wrote and were awarded some patents on some of the mechanical designs that we did up there in order to reduce the bulk. Um, but uh, and, and by reducing that bulk, we gained more physical space around the erector system so that we could actually dial that erector tube further without hitting the wall. More room to roam. Gotcha. Yeah. And Should we cover, and maybe we have another podcast, what the erector assembly is? You're reading my mind. So, yeah. So what's going on inside that scope, Sam? So you've got an objective lens. We kind I kind of mentioned this before. To most people or to a lot of people, there's two lenses there. There's an eyepiece and objective lens. There's <laughs> a lot of lenses, like you mentioned, there's 17 or something in there mm-hmm. between, I guess I should say 15 between those two, if you take those out. What can you describe, or can we try maybe and all describe? What is the erector like? It's like a tube inside the outer tube, mm-hmm. and what's going on in the erector? How does it work? How does it travel yeah. around? And yeah, so the the back of the erector tube, which is about where the magnification ring is, there's a, what's called a gimbal, and you think of it as kind of like a ball, and then and then the front of the erector tube is just it's basically suspended inside the main tube. And it's suspended by three points of contact usually. So there's the two um, erector screws or the turret screws. And then um, uh, those are um, at 90 degrees from one another. And then um, there's a a spring that's pushing opposite of those two screws that's basically pushing it up against those two screws. It's kind of like a leaf spring, right? It it can depend. Like on the AMG, it's a it's not a leaf spring; it's a coil spring. Oh, okay. Um, there's you know some people use coil springs, some people use leaf springs, and um, there's pluses and minuses to both. Um, for us uh, to get the most space, um, we went with the design we went with with the coil spring, and um, and so yeah, that's suspended up there. And so when you dial your turrets, what's happening is is that um, that erector tube's pivoting on that gimbal in the back. And um, th- those screws are pushing the um, direct tube against the spring. Sweet, sweet. So that's that's what's happening when you're dialing. Mm-hmm. And actually, too, I guess we were just talking about we we actually just today did the uh, recorded the sight in the semi live sight in podcast. We we're right. talking about if somebody were to, you know, over torque your rings and impinge something. When we say, I, I, maybe sometimes I almost wonder if when we say, oh yeah, you, like there's been an impingement in the erector unit, you know. You, torqued it down as hard as you could possibly get it. That's like 50 inch pounds. There's something going on. It's 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 impinged. Sometimes I, I've wondered before if people are probably thinking, rightfully so, what the heck are you talking about? What's impinged in there? Isn't you know, and that's essentially there's there's a free floating thing in there. Right. I kind of like to think of it almost as though that gimbal is like your uh the end of your arm that goes into your shoulder, like mm-hmm. a ball and socket. Yeah. And then the rest of the the, the erector unit is like the rest of your arm and it goes out there and it moves around Mm -hmm. and if you impinge like if you just stuck out your arm and had somebody just like grip your shoulder really hard it's really hard to move your arm around right and yeah you know so anyway but uh it's all it's all fascinating stuff i have it's always interesting talking to sam because you know that his mind works like sod works (laughs) so when he's explaining (laughs) how something's happening like you kind of have to try and follow along really closely and, and and get in his head because you know, if, if yeah, I we can, can see him. We, we can totally nerd out, like you know. But. Oh, and I and I think our <laughs> I, listeners, <I'm> in. <laughs> I think our listeners really like to uh, nerd out on stuff just based on some of the top podcasts that we've had. They've they've liked those deeper dives. So um, I think that we'll have plenty of chance to nerd out here as we dive into kind of the machining process. And uh, yeah, Sam, by all means, you have free reign to nerd out as much as you, as possible. Go into your SolidWorks mindset as much as possible too. Here, I think another thing that's total interest- nerd safe environment. Yeah, <laughs> another thing that's that will kind of become apparent to this too is, you know, we talk about manufacturing this here in addition to doing the development here, and uh, I mean this all this all happens aside from a few things that that we work on. We partner with other factories like the German Reticle, or there's some other part from some place in Sweden or Switzerland. I don't even know. No, there's just the, it's just the Reticle. Oh, it's just that's the made German Reticle, Germany. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about that, and um, 
oh, my my thought train was going somewhere, and then I got on Sweden. Um, German reticle. But, oh, I think as we kind of get into this and talk about, it's easy to see why, for example, making a product here is, is definitely super great, and, and whenever you can do that, that is that is big thumbs up, right? Go, go forth and conquer. Um, now, this scope is a scope that goes for around, I mean, retail, around $2,400, $2,500. And it's easy to see once you kind of peel back the layers of the manufacturing process and the development process and everything that's necessary, why, generally speaking, that has to happen at your higher end. Those kind of lower volume products um, that are really high end, which the AMG is. And we'll kind of get into some of the stuff that's really necessary to making a, a ultimate precision rifle scope. Uh, and so I, I don't... Well, I mean, you like to talk about cars all the time, right, Jim? Like, oh, yeah. This is, <laughs> this is like a Ferrari versus... Versus the Yugo, which is was that, which, which I never got a picture of, which actually turned out to be a Volkswagen Golf. Oh man, <laughs> right. So anyway, I, I I feel like bringing that up ahead of time, but um, diving in here. So what happened? What kind of machines are we running here, Sam? Mm-hmm. How did you go? How did you go into deciding what machines were going to be used? Um, there's three or four different kinds of machines that we have, as far as like what mills. Yeah, so the, there's there's three main kind of CNC machines that we have. So we, we have um, lathes, and then there's a Swiss-style lathe, and um, then milling machines. So um, by far, the, the vast majority of the, uh, the stuff we're um, making is made on either a lathe or a Swiss-style um, lathe. Yeah, those machines, um, you know, we, we have to buy, um, you know, pretty high-end machines that have to hold really, really tight tolerances. Um, I mean, some of the tolerances we're holding are, are pretty crazy. Like, for example, on the, the zoom cells, um, we hold diameter tolerance of plus or minus two microns, which um, two microns, that's the metric. The inch would be about 79 millionths of an inch. So to put that in perspective, a human hair is about 70 microns in diameter, and, and we're holding plus or minus two on that diameter. So it's really, really tight. Um, you can't even measure that with a micrometer because the pressure of the, the tool, um, even light pressure pushing, push, pushing on that is enough to bend it out of shape and get an incorrect measurement. Wow. Um, so we, we use air gauging, special air gauging to measure that with air. You measure something with air? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you're if you're gonna get your micrometers out, everybody put them away because we're not using those right, right now. Yeah, we're yeah. just gonna yeah. use air apparently. Yeah. How do you measure something with air? Yeah, so the air gauging <laughs> we have, it it looks like a ring gauge. So it's a it's a specially made. Um, it looks like a steel ring, and it has a hole through it, and that hole is is precision ground to uh, a particular diameter, and it has little air nozzles inside of it, and and when you put the part inside of it, there's air blowing through those air nozzles and it literally through air pressure it it wraps like a um, air all the way around the part so it's kind of floating inside of that and the and the machine can um, determine the diameter based on that airflow around the part that's insane that sounds made so. up you know what I've always wondered <laughs> so whoever invented that machine probably had to make it with something very precise so it's like you're measuring something really precise with something that's very precise but how do you make something very precise without a very precise tool? And then how do you make a very precise tool without a... How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> At what point is somebody making a precise tool with, like, a rock and a hammer? Yeah. You know, like, does it get progressively more precise as... Yeah, what did the air guy need to make his thing? Right. Well, that actually brings up an interesting thing because... So, so uh, first of all, all of our measurement tools have to be calibrated and certified every year okay and then uh, and then you ask well well what do you use to certify that and so there's actually a, a standard called a NIST standard and and uh, there's like a national um, you know uh, agency that basically they have these um, gauges and different things that are like highly protected that are like Fort Knox or something yeah I mean I mean literally and and and, and that's like the standard. And so, like for example, one of the things that we have to do is, um, is so that 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 they call that the NIST standard. The NIST standard for all of 
metrology, which is the science of measuring things, is um, everything has to be at 68 degrees to measure it. Because if your gauge that's made out of metal presumably changes temperature, it's, it, if it, go, it gets hotter, it's going to grow. And if it gets colder, it's going to shrink. And so um, the tolerances we're dealing with are so tight and so small that, that that microscopic shrinkage or growth of the part with temperature change will affect our measurements. So we actually have to keep everything at a really stable temperature when we measure it. So like the temperature in the machine shop, I know, for example, when we moved to the new facility here, you guys had to do some special stuff with the HVAC system and stuff like that to keep yeah. the temperature in the machine shop a pretty relatively constant temperature. Yeah. You do something with the coolant, too, that, that jets onto the the parts while they're being machined, right? Yeah, that num- has to be temp controlled. Yep, a number of things. So, so for one, we have uh, um, we have an in floor um, heating and cooling system. So we have these tubes that run through the concrete floor that that can be heated or cooled. To so we basically heat or cool the entire slab that the machines are sitting on, and it creates this giant thermal mass. And so the temperature of that thermal mass because it's so massive is really, really stable. Hmm. It doesn't change very fast. And so that allows us to be able to hold a really stable temperature. And so fun fact about that is, is we have about 90 miles of, of tubing in this building for heating and cooling. And according to the engineers who designed and built the building, they said it was the largest heated and cooled floor in the country. Uh, we have more in-floor heat than Lambeau field has. Uh, in in the uh, you know, at Lambeau Field, so well they they heat the grass, you know, for for those that. winter games. Well, gosh yeah. darn, yeah. Oh, you so, Seahawks fan, get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, that was a Jim, that was, it was like five games. I know, sorry, that was instinctive. <laughs> just anytime it comes up, I look at you. But in a, yeah, so then in addition to the the just the building temperature on um, the machines, when you're machining, you're spraying coolant onto the part to keep the cutting tool lubricated and everything like that. But there's a lot of friction when you're cutting, and so it creates heat. And so um, that coolant gets routed through um, uh, these machines called chillers, and those chillers actually um, control the temperature of the coolant, make sure that it's 68 degrees. So when it gets sprayed on the part, it's, it's 68 degrees. And that way, we, we keep all of the temperatures consistent from the metrology lab to the machine shop to inside the machines, the coolant that's being sprayed. And that way, there's no variable. Like, you know, for example, you, you don't want to have a machine that's spraying really hot coolant on a part. Mm-hmm. And the machinist pulls the part out, and he measures and he's like, oh, it's good. And then he sends it over to metrology, and it cools off, and now it shrinks. And they measure it, and they're like, no, it's too small. Oh. So we... We, we keep those temperatures really consistent so that we don't have that happening. That's so cool. It's wild. Um, so now we've, we've talked a little bit here about now the machines, and uh, that's, the, that's what you were just talking about. That's what the chip chiller thing is, right? Yeah. There's these machines out there called a chip chiller. Yeah. And it, it, it moderates the temperature, I guess, of that coolant. Now, there's is also that because, I mean, we're talking cooling, right? Because probably as that part's being turned or whatever and i'm sure it's heating up yeah. via friction and yep. things like that yep. and so is it it's just cooling that throughout that entire process yep. maintaining that constant 68 yep yeah you've also got it while we're on the topic of these machines and nerd out and everything you've also got chip blasters too right yeah is that a thing now the way that it's not it's not enough to just machine material away but it's actually the way that the discarded material gets blasted off of the part that yeah. has something to do with how precise yeah. the part is so the same company makes the chip chiller and the chip blaster and so um the, the machines kind of combined into one thing and so when you're machining aluminum in particular um aluminum can sometimes be kind of tricky because it's soft and it's stringy and so um sometimes what can happen is is that uh when you're machining um something on a lathe you can get a uh, well, the machinists like to call it like a bird's nest it, where it just looks like all these really super fine strings of aluminum and it almost looks like a nest of, you know, on the part. And of course what can happen there is, is that if it builds up on the cutting um, tip, then that, it, think of it almost like steel wool, but aluminum and oh, that's yeah. rubbing against the part as it's spinning. 
And so then th then it, it can ruin the finish of the part and even change the dimensions a little bit and stuff like that. And so um, there's these little nozzles on the um, cutting tool holder that spray high pressure coolant. And so the chip blaster is basically, it, it pressurizes the coolant to a real high pressure. Um, I think like, f you know, we use, uh, there's different settings, but like 500 to 1,000 PSI. And so you're blasting this high pressure coolant on the part as it's being machined. And that basically, that high pressure is breaking apart those strings of aluminum mm. so that th they don't build up and, and rub against the, the Makes part sense. of the machine. Makes sense. Yeah. So maybe let's start, let's jump in on what the process looks like from a bar stock of aluminum. And I have a feeling we'll, we'll wind up dovetailing into more machines and tolerancy crazy stuff too. But that's how these things start, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got in the, if you walk back there now to the machine shop, you'd see there's like a stack of these nice shiny billet looking bars of aluminum. Mm-hmm. And how long are those? We usually get them at 12 feet in length. Okay. Yeah. And then we cut some of them down depending on which machine they're going in, different lengths. But interesting. You say you cut some of them down. Do any of them stay 12 feet? No. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, usually, like, we have these things That's called the bar, secret scope bar feeders or bar loaders. Yeah. The one to 100. <laughs> I'm yeah. just kidding. Nobody, we're not making one of those. Just, yeah. Don't get that out of your head. Yeah. Anyway. So the machines, the CNC machines, a lot of times they'll have a bar feeder or bar loader attached to them. And depending on what that bar feeder or bar oh. loader can take, we'll cut it down. So like some of machines, it's like three foot sections. Other ones, it's six foot sections is usually what we use. And, gotcha. Yeah. So it comes in as a, uh, as a, a billet piece of aluminum. Now, what's the first step? I, I can only imagine the first step is essentially just grinding that down into a shape of a scope tube, right? Yeah, and on the scope tube, yeah, so we machine that down. It comes as a solid bar, um, and we cut those down. Um, gosh, they're probably, a l I don't know, I mean, basically look at the scope a little bit longer than what the scope is, so we cut them down into these slugs that are, I don't know, like a foot and a half long or something like that. And um, I can't remember off the top of my head what they weigh, but we re we basically we remove about ninety two percent of the aluminum off that slug to create the main tube. Wow, is that and that that ninety two percent gets removed before you even hollow it out, right? No, that includes hollowing. Oh, that includes it out. hollowing yeah. it out. Yeah, yep. So it's it's all one solid piece, which is important um, on this scope because I think one of the things that you know, uh, maybe people don't think about necessarily is they always think about just how good the glass is. But um, what's really important too is that all the optical elements are aligned really well in the scope. Mm -hmm. So by machining it out of one solid bar, we can make sure that that tube is really straight and that all the optical elements um, can align really well and, and give you better optical performance. Kind of like precision matched rings. Yeah. Machining two rings out of one solid piece of aluminum to make sure that they're much more concentric to one another, yeah. right? Yep. How are you, so you're talking about aligning those lenses. How do you, I mean, how do you align, I mean, the, the tube helps, right? Having an extremely mm -hmm. precise tube mm -hmm. to work with. But I mean, how are you aligning all these lenses up so they actually work together perfectly? Oh, I think yeah. you just jumped up to assembly. Why not? <laughs> did I? Why not? Did I jump ahead? Why did, not? No. Are we ready? Sure. <laughs> I'm ready if you are. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a lot of it's just geometry, the way that we're shaping the shoulders and the lock rings and those interfaces. And so um, uh, a lot of times, you know, the, they, uh, the lenses will passively center based on th those geometries. Um, another thing that we've done... Um, Explain passively center what, what's going on there. So a lens, if it's in the system, we don't want it to be tilted, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. You, so you want everything to be, you know, nice and aligned. And so uh, by centering, I'm, I mean that as you tighten that lock ring, um, if the shoulder that it, that lock ring's tightening that lens against is is nice and straight, it's going to basically um, tilt that lens so that it's it's straight. Okay. Oh, I get it. So yeah. in, in part of the reason why a lot of this is happening, so Sam's describing lock rings and, you know, tightening, tightening them down against these shoulders is... Obviously, when you look at a rifle scope, it's long and round, and the lenses sit in there, for lack of a better term, perpendicular to that, 
and because things are long and round, like you would ordinarily think of attaching something, you know, if I'm going to attach a bumper onto a car, you put one flat thing against another flat thing and you put a bolt through those two things and connect it. But when everything is round, you have shoulders. So these lenses butt up to a shoulder and then there's a threaded portion that then a lock ring comes in and, and it butts up to the other end and those kind of essentially compress the lens in yeah. place, correct? It clamps the like the rim of the lens in the, in the tube. And so by clamping that rim of the lens between a shoulder and a lock ring, yeah, you're, 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 you know, taking any tilt of that lens out of it. Gotcha. So you need to have, you need to not only have a precise shoulder, but you also need to have precise threading for that lock ring. You need to have a precise lock ring to come in and, yeah. And, uh, and clamp that against yep. the, um, and that, the shoulder itself. Yep. And that's why the machining, you can see, you know, when you think about that is just a tiny amount of tilt can cause, image degradation so that's why all that machining has to be so precise mm -hmm. to make sure that everything lines up really well yeah what, what would you say goes into making the best image possible and now we're kind of back onto optics I, we're just going to jump around here because we've got two uh two marketing people talking to one really smart engineer but what would you say goes biggest into making the best image is it the glass itself is it the way that the optic is assembled? Is it... Um, Optical design? Coatings, yeah. Is it the design, the curvatures? Because I think there's another thing that a lot of people... You see a lot of people say all the time, you know, on forums or on social media or, or elsewhere where they say, I'm pretty sure that, like, you know, hey, biggest difference between those two is that that one is better glass. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's this arbitrary thing out there. That one just has better glass. Like, you almost just took the same body and just tossed, quote, better glass into it. Or but even it's got this kind of glass, oh, yeah. so A is better than B. Right. What? Yeah, I, I, I would say <laughs> optical engineers get really annoyed by that because, because it's, it's such a simplistic view. So all the things you mentioned, you know, the, the, how precise things are assembled, um, the quality of the glass itself... Uh, the actual optical design, all those things play into what make uh, uh, um, an image good in a scope. And I, the, the best analogy that I've come up with, um, I think, is I like to um, use analogy of like uh, cooking and you have like a chef, for example. And it's like, okay, um, when you make a really good meal, a, a, like a really high end chef makes a really good meal. It's, it's not just the ingredients. It's how they've cooked it, prepared it, presented it. You know, all of that goes into like when you finally get that in front of you. Like, hey, this is a good meal or not. And like, uh, you know, just because you use really good ingredients, you know, uh, or like you know, really quote unquote good class, doesn't mean that you're going to get a good image through the scope. I mean, that would be like somebody taking like a Kobe beef steak and they didn't even cook it and they just threw it on a plate as your main course and then they stuffed another one in a cup and was like, okay, that's your drink. And you'd be like, well, it's Kobe beef. It's the best, you know? <laughs> and you'd be like, this sucks. Like all you did is throw a slab of meat on my plate, you know? So it, it, it's, it's so much more than that. Yeah, the, the, the coatings and, you know, it's, it's, it's not just you know, to, to use a food analogy, it's not just the ingredients, but it's how it's prepared, how it's presented, all of that matters. Right, right. Yeah, and I think I, that's always really fascinating. You know, you see two where somebody might look at two different scopes that are very similar, but a uh, big noteworthy difference is one has a bigger objective bell than the other. And, right. Oh, that one's got a brighter image, you know. And there's so many other things that go into making the image. Not only not only just the image quality, but it, can you also speak to maybe the brightness of an image too? So let's say let's yeah. talk about that one, objective lens diameter because everybody's, you know, bigger objective equals better better brighter image. But that's that's definitely not the case. I'll tell you. I, yeah. You like know. and it's definitely not untrue at the same, same oh, no, time. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that 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 whole thing I'm, I think probably where there's smoke there's fire, yep. you know? So I'm not saying that whole thing yeah. is is could put but yeah like everything in optics there there's multiple th factors that that determine something like brightness so the size of the objective lens is part of the equation 
but um, what also plays into that would be uh, the magnification of the scope, and then um, also would play into that is the actual light transmission, which is determined by how good are the coatings, or maybe even the um, the type of um, physical uh, or you know chemical formula of the different glass elements that are used to even um, the uh, um, the color tone of the image. So a lot of people, when they think of light transmission, they think of just one number, like what percent light transmission is it? Well, the visible spectrum is like from roughly 450 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. So 450 nanometers is violet light, 700 is red light, you know, and there's everything in between green, yellow, you know, all that. And so you're not going to, like, if somebody says, well, we have 95 light percent light transmission, it's like, well, what, what wavelength? You don't get just a flat 95% across the full oh. visible spectrum. It changes across the visible spectrum. And so the way that that curve looks affects how you perceive that image as being bright to the point that we've actually um, even measured some optics that overall have higher light transmission than another one. But when you do a blind test, everybody swears the one with lower light transmission is, is brighter because of, of the shape of that curve. And so that's kind of like a proprietary thing that we've studied and we kind of know the shape of the curve that seems to appeal to people to be the brightest. And it's not even just a psychological thing. Like people can literally pick things out in the dark better with, with the curve the way that they want it. So it's not as simple as reducing it down to like a percentage of light transmission either. Huh. There's like 450 areas that you could have. And, I mean, in, it's infinite. You or know, infinite. It's just, oh, okay. you know, an, an infinite uh, wavelength or, or between, infinite. Or right. infinity. between yeah. 450 and 700, you know, yeah. roughly, roughly speaking. Infinity so. minus 450. That's the difference I was <laughs> yeah. off by. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's so many rabbit trails. I just think I, optics and scopes are, they're so interesting. Um the way that they work. I mean, it's, you know, you can get a hammer and there's a lot that goes into making a hammer. I'm not going to lie. I think there's a, everything that you, you buy out there. There's a lot more that goes into making it. I think than there, than you're probably almost as of, much as there is into making a rifle scope. So <laughs> you think, wait, maybe, you know, hammers better than I do. I don't want to insult anybody. But no, I'm just saying it's just, it's very interesting because, you know, more so there's, there's the physical part of what goes into making a rifle scope, right? There's, there's just making it physically strong, physically reliable, physically, these turrets, you know, click well and things like that. But then there's also just the design of, of this is an, an object that is, that is taking light, which is something that's always there, right? Like I'm waving my hand through it right now. Right. It's taking that and it's manipulating it. And it's, it's doing things right now, just sitting on this table. It is doing things that we can't perceive or see right here now with my hand about four inches away from the eyepiece, there's an image on my hand of that foam thing on the wall. Right. Oh, I'm yeah, getting all philosophical I mean, again. Bending light. Whatever. I mean, is it, it, I mean, it, from what I've seen and the little that I understand, I mean, you guys actually cut, I mean, light rays are being cut in there. Does, I mean, does that happen? Or maybe I've seen some of those angles where like focal lengths and this like, maybe explain focal length. Yeah. Um, Sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to jump into that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're, we're bending, we're bending light rays through those lenses. So those lenses have different curvatures on them and, and yeah, you're, you're definitely bending them through there. So, and then the, and, and by cut, I guess, I don't know if you mean, uh, by that there's certain rays of light that you put different aperture stops inside the scope to basically block those from getting through because they might actually be hurting your overall image quality. So we do that. Oh. But as far as focal length goes, yeah, um, that's really, I mean, the simplest way um, I can describe it is like if you had a single lens element, it's not exactly this, but it's close enough without getting really uh, technical, is that basically it's the distance behind that lens that the, the light gets focused. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a 100 millimeter focal length, it's roughly 100 millimeters behind the lens. Now it's not exactly the case again, but um, just for most people to understand that's good enough. Yeah. 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 And then how does that play into like maybe the physical size or length of a scope then? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean that will determine that. So you know, usually like a bigger scope like this, like the AMG, has a longer focal length um, objective lens than like a one to four or one to six, which usually have much shorter focal length. So that's why the scope is shorter and smaller. Um, so that definitely plays a role for sure. And uh, generally speaking, the longer focal lengths get you more magnification. So that's why you see scopes that go to higher magnification, they're bigger. Mm -hmm. I was just about to say too, like, do you hate it when somebody asks you like, so what's better, longer or shorter focal length? Is that another <laughs> one of those things where it's like, um, oh, stop ripping everything out of context. Yeah, everything in optics is, is there, there's no straightforward answer to anything in optics. And that's one of the things is as an engineer, uh, you know, people ask me a question and it's like, well, I got to explain this because it's like, if I, if I just give the simple answer, it's like, well, technically that's not correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It depends. Yeah, I graduated actually. with a I graduated with a degree in economics, so I sometimes tell people I graduated with a degree in it depends. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that engineers probably basically yeah. <laughs> There's some things that are pretty set in stone, but when it comes to a lot of these things that we're discussing, um, okay, let's let's jump back in to the actual making of the scope real quick as well, because I I I want I'm curious. Back at the towards the beginning, you said how. Had you have known maybe what you know now, um, the the idea of creating the AMG and going through the process of manufacturing it might have been a little bit more daunting to you. Yeah, and it sounds like as far as as far as the engineering goes, that that's certainly as we can tell, and just understanding what tolerances are necessary, what you know, figuring out just weird things that happen when you're going through and something theoretically works and solid works, and you go to try to make it, and it's kind of like, well, I don't know if that's going to be possible or not. That's definitely hard, but but maybe go into the the manufacturing side of things and, and actually taking something from a bar stock of aluminum to a finished product, going through that assembly process and having things meet up at the right time. What's what's all happening there? Because that's kind of like a it's like a crazy game of risk or something. Yeah. A game yeah. I've never played. Never developing the, for sure, developing the manufacturing process was a lot more difficult than developing the scope. So the scope was hard enough on its own, but developing the manufacturing process was, was significantly more difficult and took significant more time to develop than actually developing the scope. And, uh, and that is because there's so much at play. So for example, you know, when you're dealing with these super tight tolerances, uh, I mean, the, 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 you know, yeah, what's happening is you've got a, you know, you've got a piece of bar stock and, um, even the material itself is important because maybe like this company's 6061 T6 aluminum machine's a little bit different than this company's 6061 T6 aluminum because there's not, there's not like a discrete 6061 T6. It's made up of a chemical formula of different elements. And, huh. and there's a tolerance, just like everything, there's a tolerance on what those different elements can be and how much of them there can be in order to, for it to qualify as 6061. And so just slight variations can change things like how that material machines in a CNC machine. And so, you know, figuring all that out and like, okay, which brand are we going to use? And do we have to get it certified when we get it in? And, you know, all those things. And so then, yeah, you get the material in. And Do you have different settings on, diff on different machines for different brands of aluminum? Does it go that we far try down to the just, rabbit trail? We try to just use from one source. Okay. Once, they, we, once we're like, sense. okay, this works, we're going to try to always get it from, from gotcha. that source. Makes sense. Because, yeah, if you switch now, it's like now you got to – sometimes you might have to change feeds and speeds or, you know, of, of how the, the cutting tool is cutting or, you know, the depth of cut or different things like that. You know, there's a lot of different factors to, to get the thing to machine. And when you – especially when you're holding really tight tolerances and uh, especially on aluminum parts that are like this, they're thin and they're, um, and, and they're relatively delicate. Um, I mean – you can machine something and it might look perfect, but it it might warp out of shape and you mm -hmm. can't see it with your eye. But, you know, we have these machines called CMM machines that, that can measure it. And then they'll show you on the computer screen, oh, this thing's bent out of shape, actually. Those things are crazy. It's like a giant granite table with like a big turret in the middle and a needle on the end with a 
colorful looking ruby tip. I don't know if it's ruby or not. It yeah, probably it changes. I think mean, there's different tips. Yeah. And it goes in and it, it essentially it essentially touches off on different parts of the part and it can compare it to the SolidWorks model, real life or SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. and see how intolerant you are. Looks very scientific. <laughs> Super scientific, yeah. Even just sometimes like even if I just like take a picture next to it, I feel smarter. It's it's actually it's it's almost um mesmerizing watching it work. Oh, like entirely. You can, I don't know. It's interesting. Entirely. Yeah. So so understanding some of these different things as far as even just figuring out the aluminum is tough. Yeah. Like and then, saying and tolerances and And then how you hold the part. So a lot of you know, we're using a lot of custom made fixturing inside the CNC machines. So like how you you know, uh, like on a lathe, you've got a main spindle and a sub spindle and you'll machine the part, start it, you'll start it out and you'll machine it on the main spindle. And then the sub spindle comes over, it grabs onto what you machined and then it cuts it off um, the, the main spindle. So you've got this long piece of bar stock that's being fed into the machine, right? And so once you get the, that part machine, you got to cut it off. And then where you cut it off, you have to basically finish machine that. Oh, so when the subspinal comes over and it grabs that part, there's this balance between making sure it's holding the part tight enough that it's not going to spin inside the subspinal or something like that. Um, but at the same time, if you grip it too tight, you can actually like bend the part or yeah. crush it. Yeah. And so like Those freaking robots are strong. Is yeah. that something you have to program like that tension into, or does it have yeah, like you a can. sensor that like goes? Oh, too no. tight or too loose. Or There's no sensor. So, yeah, we have to set the, the chuck pressure. Okay. So the machinists have to set the chuck pressure. And then there's a lot of, like, little tricks and stuff that we're using that are probably, you know, kind of keep that stuff proprietary. But a lot of little tricks we're using with the, some custom-made work holding yeah. in order to make sure that the part maintains its shape. And so, you know, then the machinist gets the part machined. And then, they're you know, they usually are taking a first article, which is, like, the first part that they've made for a work order. They'll take it into metrology. They'll measure it and, and, you know, verify that it's good. Or if it's not good, tell them where it's not good, and then the machinist can make adjustments. And then once they get a good part, then they can run their work order. And um, and then that work order gets basically certified. Hey, all these parts are good. Um, and then from there, um, depending on the part, you might have to um, deburr the part, um, you know, then send it out and get it anodized, um, which, by the way, anodizing changes the um, thickness of the part. So you have to compensate for that when you machine. So we had to basically learn Isn't anodizing about that. like a corrosion? It is. So aluminum doesn't rust, but it does corrode. And, um, and anodizing is basically controlled corrosion of aluminum. So when aluminum oh. quote unquote corrodes, it, it gets a aluminum oxide film on the surface. And that aluminum oxide film is porous and it's really hard. It's harder than um, the base aluminum. And so um, that's basically what anodizing does is, is that it creates an aluminum oxide layer on the surface and then they dye it. So then the, and then oh, they seal you can it. Dye. Okay. So that, that dye goes into the pores of the aluminum oxide. It gives it the color and then they seal it. And, uh, and, but that, that aluminum oxide, it creates growth. So usually the part gets bigger slightly, like hmm. on a microscopic level when you anodize it. So we have to machine to compensate for that so that after anodizing, the part is actually the shape we want it or the size we want it. And then some parts might get polished depending on which part it is after anodizing or laser that's engraved. That's got to change tolerance. Um, you know, slightly, yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, if someone get laser engraved and everything like that, and then finally, then, you know, those parts when they're, you know, then they have to get cleaned really clean before they go into the clean room for assembly. Cause we, we have to keep that area, um, you know, as dust free as possible so that you don't get specks on the reticle. And you're not seeing that when you look at the scope and, and, you know, and then through all that process, you know, because these tolerances are so tight, these parts fit together so tight is the last thing you want is when you get parts to assembly, you want these guys putting these scopes together and they're like, oh, this stuff doesn't fit. Yeah. And then you've put, wasted a lot of money and time on creating those parts to get to that point. So it's, there's a lot of control that you need in your processes to make sure that by the time everything gets to assembly, everything fits together and it fits together right and everything assembles well. So, so what I've gathered from watching a lot of this, and I remember... I, 
it, it kind of occurred to me when I first saw those big CMM machines in there. It, it, Sam, you alluded to this a little bit earlier. SolidWorks and and just like CAD programming is is such like a relatively almost small part of the whole puzzle because actually turning something in a computer, everything is perfect. The world is perfect, right? Yep. There's no gravity. There's no uh, weird differences in the air. There's no elevation change that changes air density or whatever. There's no what uh, temperature. Mm-hmm. Everything is just perfect. Well, not and, only that, I'm, I imagine you could design something to a tolerance or to a spec that there might not even be tools to make it that. Yeah, so yeah, I guess that's sure. the thing. Is kind of like when you take stuff out of a perfect world and you try and then make them in the actual world where nothing is perfect. You wow yeah. yeah. So the tolerancing is that arguably what you would say has been just it was the toughest thing to try and figure out how all these different parts that are coming from, you know, that tube that we talked about that's manuf- or that's machined out of that big bar stock of aluminum. That's not the only. Yeah. Piece by a long shot. Yeah, a big part of the optical design is tolerancing. And so um so yeah, you could you could, it same way there like in theory you could you could uh, optimize this just amazing optical system uh, on your optical design software, but it might just have these tolerances that are totally unachievable. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of the optical design process and and one of the things we do we run the, it's called a Monte Carlo analysis and that basically tells us, okay, um, based on the performance you want to achieve with this optical system, you know, um, you would need to hold these kinds of tolerances on these lens positions or tilts or different things like that. And then we can tell from that analysis, um, a lot of that, you know, we just had to learn from experience is like, okay, well, can we machine that? And then we go out and we try to machine it, you know, when we were first getting going is like, can we hold that regularly or not? And so we had to learn from experience what sort of tolerances are achievable in a mm. production setting versus what's totally unrealistic. Or even measurable. I mean, look at the one that you manufactured at two microns and you got to measure it with air. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And I mean, that was part of the learning process when we, when we were machining that. It was like, well, how are we going to measure this? And so then we had to go out and look and, <laughs> and we found this company. Yeah. And we found this company that made air gauging and, 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 you know, and then there, there was that whole process. They had to come in and they had to bring a demo unit and we had to test it out and make sure it was going to work and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and so that, you know, then finally we were like, okay, yeah, if we buy this really expensive piece of equipment, we can measure this part. What a classic <laughs> engineer thing to do. Just like get really in the weeds on something and like make it and just be like, oh man, this is super sweet. Oh wait, crap. How do we like make it yeah. work with the actual rest of the world? <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Like, and that, you, you can't teach that in in, in school really. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like and in, in not anything against, you know, engineers fresh coming out of college, but that's not something that they really teach. That's experience. Yeah. So you need to get that experience. And that's, you know, for us, it was like when we were getting going with this, we just, it took a while to like gain that experience and knowledge from just doing it. Yeah. Um, One thing that I've always found fascinating too, uh, the fasteners in the AMG. Mm -hmm. So literally screws. And we, like that's made here as well. Yeah, we make every every single um, screw in that scope, even down to these little tiny screws that... Um, hold the circuit board in for the illumination. And um, in fact, the smallest part we make in there is um, is there's uh, a little tiny clicker pin f- uh, for the um, locking knobs when you pull them up and down. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, they're, they're just, you know, they look like a, I mean, they look like a little speck, like a chip. You they lo- they make roll pin springs look huge. <laughs> so if you've ever lost a roll pin spring and just given up, <laughs> imagine losing that thing. I yeah. mean, it, it is yeah, like Sam said, it's like a crumb. Yeah, I mean it <laughs> is. So yeah, we and we so we machine yeah every part and those screws we actually make those out of uh, tool steel. So they're not just you know they're they're really yeah. And that's what those Swiss machines do, right? They they yeah. do really tiny things. Yeah, yeah. So Swiss machines, yeah, we use those for making all the all the really tiny little parts. 
I mean, generally speaking, most Swiss machines are making really small parts. We have some that make, make a little bit larger parts, but um, the big advantage for a Swiss machine is that um, they're really fast. They can make parts really fast because of their design. And if you have parts that are really tiny or especially long, thin parts, they, they do really good for those. Yeah, it's all pretty sweet stuff. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, just the the manufacturing of it all. Oh, oh, one other thing. I knew I was stalling there to see if I could think of it. You guys did an interesting test on argon gas purging. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So when we developed the scope, the traditional method that, as far as I know, uh, most everybody uses to actually uh, um, purge their scope is uh, they usually have like a screw located somewhere on the scope that has an O-ring on it. And it's like a port into the scope. And they take the screw out or before they install the screw during assembly. And then they put a whole bunch of scopes in a chamber. And it's a sealed chamber. And they close the door. And they pull a vacuum in the chamber. And then um, that pulls all the air out of the scopes and out of the chamber. And then they fill the chamber up with either nitrogen or argon or whatever they're going to use. And For waterproofing, fogproofing, stuff like that yeah. for those listeners out there. Yep. And, uh, and so then the scope, of course, is filled with that gas. And then when the pressure, when they fill the, the chamber back up and that pressure inside the chamber equalizes with the outside pressure, then the door can be opened again. And so the theory is, is that this gas is heavier than air, so it's going to stay inside the scope for long enough that you can you know, take the screw and you can screw it into the, um, the hole and seal it with that screw in the O-ring. Um, but we kind of wanted to test that. And when we were developing this whole manufacturing process, we we're like, well, how long do we have to, to do this before we get water vapor inside the scope? So we actually, um, created a test and we put a water vapor sensor inside of a, inside the chamber. And, um, we pulled a vacuum in it and we were watching the, um, the readout and we, sure enough, we saw that the water vapor went down to zero once we got a, pulled a perfect vacuum in there. And then, we slowly started filling it up with gas and it stayed at zero and it was like literally in, uh, instantaneous that the second that door cracked open when the um, pressure equalized we got a reading and we got water vapor on the sensor and it was wow. in the bottom of the chamber so the lid was on the top the sensor in the bottom of the chamber we got a reading so we were like well wow that's really fast that water vapor yeah. getting in there so um, so what we did, we decided to do is on the AMG, we actually have a system where we use a valve in there that's sealed up. So we ha still have a screw with an O-ring, but inside that is a valve, and the valve can basically be pierced by a needle. So it's kind of like, think of like how you have an, like a needle on a basketball, and you stick it in there, and you, you, you pump yeah. air into it. Same kind of concept, and so we have a machine we can mount these scopes on the machine and, and it has like a bunch of needles in it. And those needles come up, pierce the valves, they pull a vacuum through the needle and then they refill the scope with argon through the needle. And so then when the needles retract, those valves immediately seal. And, um, and then we have all the time in the world to basically put the screw with the O-ring in there. And what we did is then after the fact, we did a test where we would put the scopes through heating and cooling cycles to see what kind of internal fogging we got. And um, sure enough, the, uh, uh, the AMG um, performed significantly better than a scope that was done the traditional method with the chamber. That's so cool. So, yeah. As we kind of get towards, I, I, I think the uh, latter part of this process... Um, let's say I'm get back to, to some of his secretive stuff. I'd be curious to talk as well about some of the, like some of the final, uh, going back to when these AMGs first started coming out, some of the final steps in the, in the process. Cause I know there's like uh there's one portion of it where there's like a air table and there's lasers looking down the scope and stuff. I don't know if that's secret stuff or not, maybe, but if you could talk to it, it's very int intriguing how it goes down. Um, Last thing I'd want to hear too is what it was like to look through the first AMG. But but as far as like that kind of testing, once you're done with an AMG, you know, uh, once one is assembled, what's what? How how do you test something like that? Yeah. So we we developed a, a special test bench, and actually that's morphed into a different um, uh, testing environment. But basically, we we developed a special test bench that we use to. 
um, test the scopes and it involves, um, uh, you know, we can test things like um, image quality as far as um, resolution or we actually test uh, MTF more specifically because that's a better indicator of uh, how sharp the image appears to human eye. MTF? Uh, yeah, it's called MTF, stands for mod uh, Modulation Transfer Function. And uh, right. I, won't, I won't get into ex fine. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I won't get into explaining it more. But anyways, so we test things like MTF. We test um, the tracking of the scope. Um, you know, a whole bunch of different things. And so we've got this machine that we and every every AMG gets tested, and we test you know all of these different um, optical and mechanical um, uh, performance characteristics to make sure that it's, it's before good. every single one that goes out. Yeah, even goes in its box. Yep. Yeah, so we do. It goes through all that. Yeah. Huh. I actually didn't even realize that. Yeah. Um, sweet. So that kind of brings me, like I said, to my last thing. Mark, you might ask some other things too. Uh, but what's it like? At, how long would you say the AMG took from 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 its brainchild kind of days to actually a physical AMG? coming out of assembly and being done? I mean, the final, final one that was production ready, I mean, we started, I'm pretty sure we started in 2011 and we didn't release it. Was it 2015 or was it 16? It was one of those. 16, I think. I brought yeah, that so up I mean, that took, Yeah, it took about five years to, you know, now, I mean, we had other earlier prototypes that we had had, we had finished before that. Um, but they weren't production ready. You know, we, we would find little things here or there that we, we weren't happy with and we wanted to make it, you know, mm -hmm. improve and make it better. And so, um, you know, that, it, that probably took us like maybe two years or maybe, maybe a little bit more to actually have the first, first one. But yeah, the first one that we felt like was the, okay, this is production ready. It, um, passes all our tests. Um, yeah, that probably took like f four or five years. What was I like looking through that one? Yeah, it was pretty awesome. So, yeah, it was it was really awesome. So, uh, I don't know. Some people may have seen the picture online of that uh, big bull that I shot uh, in Utah. Oh yeah, um, and that was actually with one of the first uh, the first AMGs um, I had on that rifle. So, oh really? Was that like yeah. one of the first production ones then, or was that like a? It was a prototype. It was kind of one of the final prototypes, the final, okay. not not quite a production, like uh, more like a pilot production scope. Um, yeah, but I think that was that was in the, I'm pretty sure the fall of 2015. Yeah, so it would have been 2016. I think in June 2016 is when we actually um, started shipping. So that was October of 2015. I shot that bull, and then we announced it at shot. 2016. Okay. And then they we actually started shipping, I think, at about June of 2016. That had to have been a pretty satisfying experience. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. And I, I in that bowl, I shot that one at se about 750 yards, too. So that was pretty cool to validate. It was like, okay, we built this scope, and, you know, I had to dial for that shot because it was a long-range shot and, you know, nailed them, on, you know, right away on the first shot. So it was it was cool to kind of validate that, you know, Yep, we did everything right. Um, the scopes were performing as it should, and uh, and and we were ready to go. So that's pretty awesome. After all that testing, all that stuff, boom. Yep. that's yeah. super sweet. Mark, what else you got? I was I also had two, just like a bunch of just I don't know. I was gonna see if what I could think of, just kind of machine gun style, throwing out like fun facts. But what else you got? Man, I just had a, a couple random things. Like you know, was there anything that you know? Obviously, it's a long process, right? Was there anything you learned along the way or encountered along the way that you're like, man, I didn't see that coming, but like, maybe you didn't anticipate it, but it was an amazing thing to learn that you guys are potentially using now, or just even like a struggle along the way that was like a huge roadblock that you didn't see coming, you know, a trial and tribulation? Hmm. I'm trying to think of something that, that, <laughs> wouldn't be like uh, something in our arsenal of like secret sauce right. that we learned, yeah, you know? Yeah. Cause there's definitely things like that, that we learned. Um, well, heck, even half the things you're talking about now, I'm like, should we be talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I know there were some things off the top of my head. I'm trying to think if there's anything that really stands out. Um, 
I, 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 you know, it was just a whole bunch of little things. I mean, I think, I think one of the cool things about the whole process is just that th- the team that we have, um, and that we had for AMG was just such an awesome team because I felt like there were, there were multiple moments where we were like, something wasn't working right. And we were just completely stumped and we were like, this should be working and it's not. And we have no idea why it was just like incomprehensible as to why that wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't work with the way we thought it should. And then it seemed like we were like throwing up our hands and, and we were at a loss. And then inevitably all of a sudden somebody would be like, Hey, what about this? And we would test that. And then it would be like breakthrough. We figured it out. And that happened multiple times. And, and I feel like we've never, um, encountered something like that, that, that we didn't eventually figure out. So, um, I think that's just one of the cool things about my team is that they just seem relentlessly to go after stuff and figure stuff out. That's cool. So way yeah. cool. What's uh what's the most complicated part to manufacture in there? It doesn't you don't have to tell us how you do it, but what's hmm. Um the most complicated part is the um we call it the outer cam sleeve for the um the erector tube. So when you when you dial your magnification ring, there's there's two lens cells. Um, we call them the, the zoom cells that move uh, forward and backward um, inside the erector tube along the axis of the scope. Mm-hmm. And they have to the way that they move and their distance from each other is is very carefully um, timed. Oh, it's not constant, is it? No, they it's don't not always constant. stay like five inches or centimeters or whatever apart. They Right. Get closer and farther apart. Right. So there's two tubes, um, two main uh, tubes that, that make up the erector tube. There's an inner erector tube, we call it, and then an outer cam sleeve. And the inner erector tube has a, a long slot on it. And then the outer sleeve has these, um, like, spir- two spiraling slots. And so the cell has this little, um, I don't know, I'll call it, just to make it easy, but think of it as like a little peg sticking off of the side of the cell. And that peg goes through the, the straight slot on the inner, um, uh, the, the inner, uh, erector tube. And then it also goes through one of the, um, spiraling slots in the outer cam sleeve. And mm-hmm. so eat, and then, and so when you, when you dial that, when you rotate that outer cam sleeve, it basically pushes against that peg and it pushes those zoom cells forwards and backwards. And, um, that's a hard part because that outer cam sleeve, it's a, it's a thin part. And then when you have these spiraling slots going around it, you can imagine that the, like that part is, um, relatively flimsy mm-hmm. and so it can twist out of shape really easily. And so we, that, that one took, that was like a huge engineering challenge as to how, figure out how to make the work holding on the lathe just right and how to machine it just right and with the right kind of tooling and the right order of operations and everything so that the the end part that you get is actually measured correctly and then even measuring it was a challenge too so you can imagine those spiraling slots um with the cmm you know you talked about that ruby probe we actually have to scan it with the ruby probe so it's not just touching it in discrete points but it actually comes down and it lightly touches it and then actually scans all the way around each one of those slots oh whoa that's Mm. and it and then uh and then it throws up on the screen on the 3d image of it it shows you like a, a temperature map like like green or red, depending on oh, yeah. how far out of tolerance it is. I've, yeah, I think I've seen that thing. I remember one time I walked in and I was kind of like, holy smokes, this thing is just like way all over the place. It's like, it looks like a freaking troughs and valleys everywhere. And I was like, what's going on there? And they're like, oh, hold on, let me zoom out. And they zoomed out and it was just like a freaking just straight line. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you were looking at like 0.1 microns or something. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. I yeah. it was DNA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that part's really, really challenging to make. Um, but, you know, we've, we finally got the process down and, and got it to where, you know, everything works good. So Love it. Um, shoot, I had one. Oh, uh, I thought listeners might be interested here. The machines can destroy themselves, can't they? If you program oh, yeah. them wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's like a, a self-destruct button. There's a no, lot of just force like... in those machines, and um, 
and fortunately we've never had any really catastrophic crashes but a lot of the machine service guys who've, who've come to, to you know uh, calibrate machines for us or whatever have told us some horror stories about uh, some other places where guys have just like ripped t- entire turrets off of machines and <sighs> You know, and some of those machines are really big and heavy. Ours are, I mean, ours are big and heavy, but n- not even close to how big some of them can get. I yeah. mean, some of ours are like 16,000 pounds or, you know, or more. But, I mean, there's oh, like all- machines that are like 30, 40, or 100,000 pounds, you know, yeah. or even bigger. And, uh, yeah, if, if one of those things crash, they have so much power. They can do major Because they basically, before you program them, they don't understand where they are. They're, they're just, they're in space, right? It kind yeah. of it, like I they I don't know I mean I don't want to act like the machines are stupid, but I mean some machines have protections on them. Okay, you know um so but you can imagine like um like a stock machine the 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 company that makes the machine they can put protections on it and say well I'm not going to allow the turret to move over here or over here because I know I'm going to smash into like like a spindle or something. Mm-hmm. You can do that, but then as soon as you start putting tooling on that turret, now all of a sudden you've got some big boring bar hanging off the thing, and you know you can put whatever you want on that turret. And they so can the, predict what yeah, you're going to put on. They can't gotcha. predict that. Now some machines will allow you to then program into the machine and say, "Well, I've got this boring bar, and it's this long, and it's this diameter, and it's on this station on the turret, or whatever." And then it'll it'll try to compensate for that. But not every machine. And I mean, you know, people before have you know, run those tools into things, you know, knocked turrets off, knocked spindles off. There's, you know, these really um, expensive uh, um, tool presetters, they call them, that that, um, you touch the tools off to teach the machine the location of the cutting tip. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, you can, like, guys have ripped those things off. And, I mean, not in our shop, but, you know, just the stories we've heard and and the oh. robot that does the laser engraving, so there's this station over where the laser engraving happens, and parts come in on a belt, and there's one of those yellow arm robots. You see them if you ever watched a, a video on a, um auto manufacturing mm-hmm. plant, yeah. um, which I naturally have. Um, <laughs> but where... You know, they just they it comes in and it grabs stuff off this belt, and then there's a laser in there. Yeah. And the laser, I forget what moves, the laser or the arm. It's just the robot arm, so the laser is fixed. And the robot arm kind of like yeah it moves around. It and moves it, the part um, as the laser's engraving it. And anywhere you see white on this black anodized scope piece, so this eyepiece, the mag ring, the turrets, yeah. the scope body. That's all laser engraving. Yeah. And so it has to move these really finite movements. Yep. And it does this one crazy thing when it's getting the, I think it's right where it says, right underneath the turrets where it says right and up, I think. But where it it grabs an entire scope tube. So it's this, it's this arm. And you talk about something too that those things literally like you have to program every movement they make, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing I will say about the markings is the laser does have some latitude. Mm-hmm. So it's got, like, like it doesn't just engrave at one very specific point. So, like, okay. a letter, the, the robot doesn't have to actually move okay. move it to engrave the letter. Gotcha. Like, it, the, the laser can actually engrave at within a certain volume. So, uh. like, if it has text, like, the robot... You know, if it's within a certain volume, the robot can just hold it still, and then the laser will kind of move move the beam around. Okay, and okay, it. understood. But but the cool thing that I was getting at was that this arm goes down and it grabs the scope tube off of the belt, and then Sam, you can explain this better. But it actually it brings it up and you know, and it brings yeah. it up, and then it drops it briefly, but catches it again, <laughs> like really quick. Yeah, and then it waits. And you watch the scope tube kind of like, like, right, like settles. Mo- settle. Yeah. And it sits there and it waits until it like gets perfectly, precisely settled. And then it, and it moves it back over and then it starts the lasering process. Like what, I yeah. mean, is, is that what it's doing? How do you program yeah. that in? The, the way, the reason we did that is because we, we have a, um, what's called a datum surface on the, um, the gripper, um, arm of the the mc ryan pulled up the video that he took one time 
And so, so it grabs the scope, but then it, it then it flips the scope up and and then ungrips, and it just uses gravity to let the scope drop down onto the datum surface on the gripper. Okay. And then, and then I think that the programmer probably just programmed in a dwell time. They're like, okay, well, if I let it sit there for ten seconds or whatever it is, that's enough time to allow the scope to like settle and stop shaking and moving around, and then it can regrip it. And, um, and it does that just so that the scope is really straight on that gripper arm. And then in addition to that, so there's actually two cameras in the system. We have a camera on the actual robot arm, and then we have another camera that's fixed next to the laser. And so then the robot arm, after it's settled and it regrips, then it actually holds the tube in front of the other camera, and, it, and the camera looks at the tube, and it, and it tells... Um, it tells the robot exactly how the tube is oriented on its gripper arm so it knows how to hold it when it engraves it. Wow. And all the parts it does that, really. Like, it, you know, the one camera is for the robot to find the part on the belt, and then um, the other camera is to tell the um, robot how the part is oriented on its gripper. So cool. Yeah. Well, Sam, we kept you a little bit beyond our uh, our timing here, so we've got to make sure that uh, you have some time to get back to your stuff. But we do have a thing that we do. We just call it Last Calls. So it's like whatever's on your mind that you want to close out with. If you're feeling real, you know, motivational, you know, motivational speech has yet to happen, but you could you could make that a thing. Uh, otherwise, if it's just kind of like a, a summary or something like that, go for it. Um, I'll start as an example. Uh I'm glad that we got Sam in here to talk about some of this stuff. Um, like I said, it's interesting. His mind works like solid works. Um, sometimes talking with him, it's like watching Inception happen right before your eyes <laughs> because he actually has tabs open in his brain. And um, he has to minimize all those in his brain before you can like get a good conversation in. Um, doesn't, I'm not saying it takes a really long time, but you can actually kind of see it happen. So it's like, you know, cause he's in a, he's in a SolidWorks assembly essentially, you know, and then that assembly has a couple of parts and he's got to, he's got to click through all those parts. And next thing you know, he's designing a fastener, you know, that goes into a, this and a, that and a, that. So once he minimizes all his windows, um, you know, then you get, you, you've got, you've got full on Sam, but, uh, it, it is, it's awesome, uh, getting to talk about some of the stuff. I know, like I said, a lot of people wanted to know some of the stuff that goes into the behind the scenes of making a rifle scope. Um, we, I, there's even probably some stuff that we missed, I'm sure. But, uh, but nonetheless, I think that's still a pretty cool view into it. So that's all I got. I don't even know if that was a really great last call. I think, I think, for it. I think it's, a, I think that is a great last call, man. Mine is, uh, Sam always, a pleasure talking with you, um, as per usual. Uh, as per usual, I didn't understand a thing you said. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, welcome uh, to the club. <laughs> but it's it's so cool having you on to talk about some of the stuff. And and you know we had Dave on talking about equally cool stuff. And uh, I guess my my last call is I'm I'm, I'm glad the egg split because we got two of the smartest guys I know. So. Yeah. Yeah. My other last call is when I asked last time if uh, I was wondering if either Dave or myself was adopted because he was going into his spreadsheets about lightweight hunting and that just <laughs> completely bores me. Yeah. Uh, we, we've talked to now the two most secretive and most engineering brothers on the podcast. So uh, people might think indeed that I am adopted and I could absolutely see that. The other one might make you think otherwise, but he has, <laughs> he has yet to be on. So. We'll get him. Anyway, yeah. Um, okay. Last call for me. So uh, I, I think, you know, earlier I had talked about, um, you know, I shot that bullet 750 yards with that, um, you know, kind of pilot production AMG. So what was really cool about that is after I shot that bull with, with, with the AMG. And so I'm going to brag a little bit, I guess, but I was like, you know, I really felt like I could have shot further than that, but that was shot. That was with a six five Creedmoor, actually. So, um, props to the six five. It 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 can uh, take down a bull elk at seven hundred and fifty. Um, dropped him in his tracks, but I I said, you know, I think I could go further, but I don't think the six five can go much further than that. <gasps> so, um, I built a twenty eight nosler, and then this year, actually, one of the um, one of my other um, uh, guys in in our group, one of my other engineers, he actually used my 28 nozzler to shoot a bull elk um, in Idaho at 950 yards with a with an AMG, 
Um, so that was really hey. cool. That was uh, long ways. that was Ian Clem, who's uh, happens to be two time FTR national champion. Yeah. So if anybody can make that shot, it's it's him. It, we yeah, we've talked uh, about it before. It's like if if you hit, if you take a shot and you wonder did I hit it, you're probably shooting at an animal too far. Yep. With Ian Clem, I doubt he was wondering if he hit it. Yeah, yeah, he pretty much <laughs> knew. So that was pretty awesome. He and he's never um, hunted out west before, and he's never shot an elk before, and so that was kind of a first for him. Uh, but that was really cool to see him get that elk that far, but also then again, validating the AMG. Um, I mean, it's, and, and th those are just two examples, but I mean, other people have taken animals at really long distances with the AMG. So it's definitely capable and it's cool to see that, Hey, we, we designed and we developed this thing and then we actually went out and we used it to, to do something that is not that easy for a lot of people to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so yeah. 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 And it goes to show too, that like, as cool as it is that it's made, you know, in a sense, and in, in just so much of it happens right here in this facility. That's not the reason that we made it. Right. I mean, the reason we made it was to be a freaking phenomenal optic. And yep. so, you know, it's doing its job out there. Uh, but anyway, man, I, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I got to go do math problems or practice, uh, geometry or something, something smart, something numbers yeah um but anyways as always thanks everybody for listening uh hit us up on on instagram mc ryan reminded me that we had some videos of some of these robots and machines here we should uh we should post some of those on the instagram page yep for people to check out and uh yeah let us know if uh if there's anything else you want to hear too about you know behind the scenes of making a rifle scope etc um thanks again to sam for coming on happy hunting and shooting everybody and uh we'll see you next time we'll see you next time all right bye, bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.